Hi, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Ashley Griffin, a Broadway performer, writer, and theater journalist. This is my co-host, Poppy. Say hi. hi. Say hi to the people. Hello. If you're new here, welcome. Don't forget to click the subscribe button for more from your theatrical Hermione Granger. I think it would. Hello. Do you want to hear about Camelot? You want to hear about Camelot? It's a good story. You want scratches? Come sit down. Camelot's a good story. Here, sit your pretty butt down and let's listen to the story of Camelot. Recently, while chatting with a friend, the new Lincoln Center revival of Camelot came up in our discussion. This friend is a member of the Broadway community and yet didn't really know the musical or the story behind it. Not that they necessarily wanted to. What they did know was that Camelot has a reputation for being too long and too dull, and though it has some beautiful music, isn't really super meaningful or inspiring. Based on the majority of the reviews that just came out for the Lincoln Center revival, my friend was correct, but I believe that the essential story of Camelot is one of the most meaningful and inspiring in human history. Does the musical live up to the tale it's telling? Not necessarily. Despite the stunning learner and low score and beautiful moments within the show, not to mention the memory of the original performances, now primarily only experienced through the original cast album and snippets on YouTube from the Ed Sullivan show, the musical leaves much to be desired, exacerbated by the frustrating film adaptation in 1967. But the heart of the story is still in there, though it has become more and more diluted with each passing decade. The original tale is one that, when the musical first opened on Broadway in 1960, was commonly known, and just as we walk into Anne Juliet today, understanding the source material the show uses as a jumping off point, so audiences in 1960 did, if to perhaps a lesser degree, with Camelot. The classic novel, The Once and Future King, a retelling of the Arthurian legend, had just been published in 1958 and was a hit. The novel is a collection of shorter stories which were published from 1938 to 1940 and is loosely based on the 1485 work Le Mort d'Arthur. Fantasy historian Lynn Carter called it the single finest fantasy novel written in our time, or for that matter, ever written. And it's no coincidence that Disney produced an adaptation of The Sword and the Stone, an adaptation of the first section of the novel, in 1963. Camelot, both the musical and idea of Camelot, were also closely associated with the JFK White House, both during his presidency and, tragically, even more so after his death. In the early 60s, the Camelot story was very much in the zeitgeist in a way that it isn't today. But a deep love of the story goes back much further than the 1960s. King Arthur and Camelot are unique in storytelling in that they sit in a gray area between historical and mythological tales. There is a historical basis for King Arthur, who is believed to have lived around the 5th to 6th century AD, and potentially the utopian kingdom of Camelot. It has, however, largely faded into myth, and not only do historians disagree regarding Arthur and the events of his life, but myths about him vary remarkably from version to version. But because of this unique blend of mythology and history, the tale of Camelot is able to affect us in a very special way. Camelot is the story in the general public consciousness that comes closest to describing a real-life utopia on Earth, examining both how it was created and made to flourish because of what is best in humanity, and how it collapsed because of what is most tragic in human nature. There are few stories that get so close to the heart of the human condition. Here's a little context and backstory. As I said, there are hundreds of different accounts of Camelot, but these are the broad strokes about what is generally agreed upon. During the time that Arthur allegedly reigned, England and its surrounding countries functioned much more as tribes than as the kind of unified country we think of today. The word England comes from Angleland, and indeed the Angles and Saxons, not to mention the Britons, where we get the word Britain, 
were just two of the groups, or tribes, at war with each other. On top of that, Christianity was making its way into the Celtic world, and there was a serious religious and cultural clash going on at the same time. It seemed all but impossible to unify all the people, but if they didn't unify, the different tribes would just keep battling each other until one group wiped all the others out. Into this situation comes Arthur. Arthur was not raised as a prince, and it was not a foregone conclusion that he would take the throne. There are differing accounts of his upbringing, the two most popular, though wildly divergent, with the exception of the inclusion of Merlin the wizard, or Celtic priest, depending on your slant, as his childhood mentor, being Disney's The Sword in the Stone and the novel-slash-miniseries The Mists of Avalon. But the important thing historically and religiously is that because of Arthur's parentage, he was a connection between the Christians and the Celts. He was basically raised by a Celtic mage, but understood and respected Christianity. Again, there are variances to this story. Arthur is a good, kind person. And most of Merlin's teachings involve things like Merlin turning Arthur into a bird, allowing him to understand that borders are a man-made invention, etc. England at the time had a lot of disagreements about who should be king, especially given the fact that various tribes were constantly warring with each other. But at some point, the great enchanted sword Excalibur was magically plunged into a stone, and a prophecy was declared that whoever pulled the sword from the stone should be England's next king. At the time, Camelot was basically the capital of England. Years went by, and no one could pull it out. Then one day, little Arthur, working as a squire, had to find a replacement sword for the knight he was serving. He saw a sword stuck in a stone, and, not realizing what it was, quickly picked it out and gave it to the knight. When it was discovered what had happened, he was instantly declared king. Side note, there is a legend that someday Arthur will return, and there is a lot of hilarious fan fiction about Arthur walking into modern-day Parliament, and legally, they have to turn over all power to him. I believe there is even an ancient clause for it in the British Constitution, and if there isn't, I want to imagine that there is. <laughs> More time goes by, and two things happen. The first is that Arthur comes of age to marry, and the other is that he gets absolutely fed up with the way the knights, the police of their day, were operating. The mantra of the time was, might is right, meaning that whoever had the most power always got what they wanted. Some of this was dressed up in religious justification. For example, if there was a disagreement between two people, the rule was that they would have a trial by combat, meaning the two disagreeing parties would fight to the death, and whoever lived was declared in the right, because, after all, why would God allow an innocent person to die? You saw your neighbor steal your horse, but there are no witnesses, and your neighbor is no longer in possession of said horse? Trial by combat. You die? Well, you must have been a liar. Otherwise, why would God have let that happen? But Arthur noticed it was no coincidence that the folks with the most expensive armor and weapons always came out on top. That meant that, really, whoever had more money and power won. And that led to a lot of knights acting pretty horrifically towards the common man. After all, if a knight had an awesome sword and armor and you were a poor peasant with nothing but a pitchfork, why wouldn't he steal your horse? You definitely wouldn't stand a chance against him in combat. And against this backdrop is where the musical Camelot begins. Let's use the musical as the basis on which to discuss the central ideas of the King Arthur story. The musical sits pretty squarely in the middle of the hundreds of versions of the tale and is probably how most people today were introduced to the legend. The musical focuses on the fall of the utopian Camelot and the three characters at its center, Arthur, Guinevere, and Lancelot, whom the musical presents as complex and fully formed, especially for the era in which the musical was written. Arthur, our protagonist's principal life objective is to sincerely be a good person and to do good in the world. And he accomplishes this goal without being saccharine and for completely altruistic reasons. Successfully writing a character like that is no mean feat. But what Arthur must come to learn, and indeed one of the themes of Camelot, the theme that creates such a moving, somehow hopeful tragedy, is that goodness is not a guaranteed fortification against the darkness of the world. The musical opens at the end of his story, 
with King Arthur on the eve of a battle which, he knows, will cause Camelot to fall. He calls out for his mentor Merlin, though he knows it's hopeless. He will never see Merlin again. One of the elements of the Arthurian legend, which it could be argued the musical spends too much time on, is that the great wizard Merlin lives backwards, meaning he gets younger as time goes by and he remembers both the future and the past. One of the reasons Merlin was so passionate about completing Arthur's education as quickly as possible is that Merlin knows that at some point he will be enchanted by, well, she has different names in different versions, but let's call her the Lady of the Lake, and trapped in a tree for a very long time. There's actually a very poignant moment in the musical where Merlin becomes trapped. The last words he speaks are a panic about whether he's warned Arthur about Guinevere and Lancelot. Already getting a lot of divergent side plots that are kind of confusing? Don't worry, <laughs> we'll address that in a bit. Arthur starts to wonder how he and Camelot ended up here. And the show jumps into an extended flashback, really the entire musical except for the very beginning and very end is a flashback, to the day of his arranged marriage, when he ran away into the forest absolutely terrified about his upcoming nuptials to a woman he'd never met. And thus begins what I think is one of the greatest extended musical scenes in the musical theater canon. Honestly, I think it would be a welcome alternative to the oft-done bench scene from Carousel in musical theater performance classes around the world. At this point, Arthur is a young king. He's still adjusting to his role and the pressure that comes from being the chosen one. He's a young man, barely more than a boy, and he wants to be a good king and a good husband. But, as he says as part of the answer to the question of his I want song, I wonder what the king is doing tonight. He's scared. Oh, he's scared. He's betrothed to a princess named Guinevere, who he's never even seen, and he doesn't know what to do. Suddenly, a young woman comes crashing in. Arthur hides. He's still trying to shake off the guards who are searching for him. The young woman turns out to be Guinevere, who is also terrified at the prospect of being married to a stranger, and while en route to the castle, has also run into the woods. She sings the wonderful Where Are the Simple Joys of Maidenhood, in which she comically, but poignantly, grieves for the loss of any freedom, joy, love, or excitement in her life. The song opens seriously with a prayer. You know how faithful and devout I am. You must admit I've always been a lamb, but Genevieve, Saint Genevieve, I won't obey you anymore. You've gone a bit too far. I won't be bid and bargained for like beads at a bazaar. Saint Genevieve, I've run away, eluded them and fled. And from now on, I intend to pray to someone else instead. O oh, Genevieve, Saint Genevieve, where were you when my youth was sold? Dear Genevieve, sweet Genevieve, shan't I be young before I'm old? Guinevere is definitely giving strong, intelligent, and very Princess Jasmine vibes from the word go. Arthur is instantly smitten, and realizing that this is his betrothed, starts to think that married life might not be so bad after all. He reveals himself to Guinevere, but not wanting to scare her off, doesn't tell her he's the king. They have some phenomenal banter, which is not only charming and character developing, but is a truly beautiful representation of positive masculinity, which goes miles towards making us love Arthur. Knowing that she's frightened, Arthur first does everything he can to put her at ease and make her feel safe, though Guinevere comically complains when she realizes he's not going to kidnap her and carry her off as she's so desperate to be rescued from this marriage and to have a little adventure. And then Arthur does something lovely. By this point, we know he's utterly enchanted by her and wants nothing more than to go back to the castle and get on with the wedding. But that's clearly not what she wants. He has all the power in this situation. But he tells her that, if she wishes it, he will sneak her out of Camelot, make sure she's taken to wherever she wants to go, and offers her a way out of this marriage. Guinevere is a bit taken aback. It seems she's not used to people listening to her feelings and treating them with respect. He does, however, say that Camelot and the king might not be as bad as she thinks, thus beginning the title song Camelot, which, in an ironic dramaturgical structure, establishes stasis one of this story. Usually stasis one is an establishment of what's wrong with the world of the story that must change. This would be Cinderella working as a servant in her own house, Dorothy not being listened to and getting into trouble in Kansas, but the stasis one of Camelot is literally a happily ever after. The hook of the chorus is, in short, there's simply not a more congenial spot 
for happily ever aftering than here in Camelot. We are starting the story in a utopia that cannot and will not last. Suddenly, the king's guards arrive and Arthur tries to get Guinevere out of there and off to her freedom. But before he can, the guards kneel and the jig is up. Guinevere realizes the charming vagabond she's been talking to is actually the king. Embarrassed, Arthur tells her the story of how he became king, pulling the sword from the stone, and how he feels overwhelmed by the responsibility. He then sticks to his word and tells Guinevere that he will gather transportation to take her home. But by this point, Guinevere has fallen in love with Arthur. She stuns him when she sings a brief reprise of Camelot, basically saying, I'm in. I want to stay. And thus we have one of the fastest and yet most organic and honest establishments of a romance in the musical theater canon. Guinevere, along with Arthur, is a fully fleshed out human being. She is beautiful, certainly, but that is far from her most important or defining characteristic. In fact, if anyone gets relegated to being the arm candy in this story, it's Lancelot. Guinevere is incredibly smart, passionate, kind, and just a bit rebellious. It is largely because of her that Camelot becomes the great kingdom it does. She and Arthur work as a team. They love each other, complement each other, and support each other. Her identity is not defined by Arthur, but rather, for lack of a better description, step in step with him. But Guinevere's fatal flaw is that deep down, she longs for crazy, passionate adventure, the kind that doesn't care if it creates a little destruction along the way, and where she is inevitably the center of attention. Remember her I Want song, The Simple Joys of Maidenhood? Well, it goes on from the introduction that I read. This is the heart of her prayer. Where are the simple joys of maidenhood? Where are all those adoring, daring boys? Where's the youth pining so for me he leaps to death in woe for me? Oh, where are a maiden's simple joys? Shan't I have the normal life a maiden should? Shall I never be rescued in the wood? Shall two knights never tilt for me and let their blood be spilt for me? Oh, where are the simple joys of maidenhood? Shall I not be on a pedestal, worshipped and competed for? Not be carried off, or better still, cause a little war? Where are the simple joys of maidenhood? Are those dear, gentle pleasures gone for good? Shall a feud not begin for me? Shall kith not kill their kin for me? Where are the simple joys of maidenhood? It's presented in a humorous way. Guinevere is certainly sincere in her desires, but it's framed a bit as the slightly overdramatic daydream of a teenage girl, not unlike Louise's monologue before much more in The Fantastics. As we've seen, she quickly meets Arthur, falls in love with him, and realizes there's a deeper, more grounded kind of love that is far more desirable. And yet, the seed of simple joys of maidenhood never quite dies within her. And by the end of the show, she will end up getting exactly what she prayed to St. Genevieve for, discovering that it's, in reality, a pretty horrible thing to experience or wish for. The rest of the musical gets a lot of criticism for being far too long and sometimes boring. There is quite a lot of musical to get through, not least of which is because Lerner and Lowe bring in a lot of other elements of Arthurian legend that don't really have to do with the central story at the heart of this particular piece. Not to mention that even a length of about three hours doesn't provide enough time to properly tell all the aspects of the central story. The Arthurian legend is epic, encompassing dozens of side characters and quests. Each of the Knights of the Round Table is basically the hero of their own odyssey, and you have to pick and choose how many side stories you want to go on. Think of it like the Lord of the Rings. For the films, Peter Jackson made the smart decision to focus on the through line of Frodo and the Ring. This led to the cutting of some fan favorite moments. Tom Bombadil, anyone? But it kept the story streamlined and focused while still maintaining the work's integrity. Lerner and Lowe clearly wanted to focus on the love triangle aspect of the Arthurian story and how the clash between utopian ideals and human nature led to the fall of the possibly greatest, in terms of peace and goodness, civilization the world has ever known. But 
periodically, a random Arthurian character will suddenly show up and have a major scene that really is only relevant if you're a diehard Arthurian fan and know the backstory of what's going on. There is also a tendency to lean into lengthy charm songs, such as What Do the Simple Folk Do?, that, while lovely, and in that example especially poignant when placed against the subtext with which it is sung, don't advance the plot and just slightly overstay their welcome. So let's focus on the central throughline of the story. Years go by. Arthur and Guinevere are very happily married and very much in love, but Arthur is frustrated at the might is right attitude of his knights and the culture at large. During a conversation with Guinevere, he has a flash of inspiration. Might for right, not might is right. He decides to create an entirely new system of government, one where those in power are in service of goodness and chivalry. Disputes will be determined not by combat, but by a neutral justice system that treats everyone as equal. Knights shall be protectors of the poor and disenfranchised. Note, this is where the idea of a knight in shining armor comes from, though certainly the defense of women in a chivalrous, not domineering way, is an aspect it's based on the idea that no matter who you are, if you're in trouble, a brave knight will come to rescue you. Indeed, in Arthurian legend, knights not only rescue damsels, but children, men, the poor, and entire towns. And part of their code of conduct was to do so in a selfless manner. They did good deeds for the sake of being good. If they did rescue a damsel, it was without thought and not for the purpose of winning the girl. If a metaphor is helpful, Imagine if a host of angels literally served as the police force. Arthur also conceives of his infamous round table. Typically, a king's table was rectangular with the king sitting at the head. In a round table, everyone is equal. The king is no more important than any of those who serve him. Arthur's system goes into effect, and it is a wild success. Though, some knights are a little disgruntled that they can't go around just taking things from people anymore. Camelot starts to attract the greatest warriors from across the land, all of whom desire to serve as one of Arthur's knights and do good. The most infamous of these, and the most important to this story, is Sir Lancelot. Lancelot is, quite simply, the greatest knight who ever lived. He has never lost a battle and has completely dedicated himself to God. He's basically a living saint. In my opinion, the musical does itself no favors by leaning so heavily into Lancelot's personal agreement with the facts I've just stated. His entrance song is C'est moi, it's me in French, with lyrics such as, I've never lost in battle or game. I'm simply the best by far. When swords are crossed, tis always the same. One blow and au revoir. C'est moi. C'est moi, so admirably fit, a French Prometheus unbound, and here I stand with valor untold, exceptionally brave, amazingly bold, to serve the table round. I've never strayed from all I believe, I'm blessed with an iron will. Had I been made the partner of Eve, we'd be in Eden still. C'est moi, c'est moi, the angels have chose to fight their battles below, and here I stand, as pure as a prayer, incredibly clean, with virtue to spare, the godliest man I know. It's giving pretty strong Gaston vibes, and honestly makes him seem pretty unlikable on first impression, which is not the most helpful choice given the role Lancelot needs to serve in this story. Lancelot is welcomed into Camelot, quickly becoming Arthur's best friend and greatest knight. Guinevere, however, shares my initial opinion of him, at least based on how he's presented in the musical, and loathes him from the word go. She thinks he's a pompous jerk, and through the charming, but again, long, song, Then You May Take Me to the Fair, convinces the three best knights, after Lancelot, to challenge him to a joust at their upcoming fair, hoping at least one of them will knock some humility into him. Lancelot shares a similar objective to Arthur, but framed slightly differently. Lancelot wants to be God's servant on earth and feels the proof that he has accomplished this goal will be being named the greatest knight of the round table. And that declaration isn't far off because for all his boasting, he has the goods to back it up. When the foretold fair day comes, he easily bests the three other knights. Indeed, he is so strong that he accidentally kills one of them. But when that happens, Lancelot does something extraordinary. 
He goes to the man, holds him, prays, and quite literally brings him back from the dead. And in that moment, Guinevere falls desperately in love with him. Though Arthur is kind, devoted, and loyal, Lancelot is everything her girlish fantasy dreamed of. And Lancelot is falling for her too. The writing is on the wall, and even Arthur knows it. Lancelot must learn that even the most godly man is still a man. And if he clings to the idea that infallibility is part of being godly, then he will never meet the standards he set and demanded of himself. Whereas Guinevere's tragedy comes from literally getting everything she asks for in her first song, Lancelot's comes from discovering that nothing he said in his first song is actually true. The rest of the story is actually pretty concise, though, again, padded out with a lot of filler. Merlin is ensorcelled, and Arthur can't rely on his advice anymore. Lancelot, Arthur's best friend, and Guinevere, the love of his life, start having an affair, both horrified by what they're doing and how they're betraying someone they care so much about, but unable to stop themselves. Arthur doesn't know what to do. He is deeply hurt, but he loves both Lancelot and Guinevere, so, though devastated, he basically decides to look the other way. This offers us another beautiful example of positive masculinity. When Arthur realizes there's trouble in paradise, he sings the seemingly problematically titled How to Handle a Woman that features this hook. How to handle a woman is to love her. Simply love her. And then a new character appears, Mordred. If there is a physical character who is the villain of the piece, aside from the villain metaphorically being human nature, it is he. Mordred in Arthurian legend is actually a fascinating character. But in the musical, we both don't spend enough time truly delving into his history and complexity and spend too much time shoehorning the backstory of an 11th hour character into a story that's barreling towards the finish line. It's somehow too much and not enough. In Arthurian legend, Mordred is an adult son Arthur didn't know he had. Stemming from, well, there are many versions of this part of the story, and some of them get very dark and definitely not for children. Mordred is very much part of the Fae, the Fae meaning the fairy world or the residence of fairy, as well as the magical world of Avalon, which is part of the Celtic mythological world. And for various reasons, again, depending on the version of the story you're reading, wants to take Arthur down. He insinuates himself into Arthur's court, looking for a way to do just that. And here's where we get to the heart of what makes Camelot such a complex and moving story. Mordred finds a gigantic loophole in Arthur's might for right philosophy when he discovers Guinevere and Lancelot's affair. Equality and justice are all well and good until you're forced to deal with a personal conflict according to those values. Mordred forces Arthur's hand when he and others, he makes sure there are witnesses, catch Guinevere and Lancelot in the act and immediately has them taken away on charges of treason. In those days, it was considered high treason for a queen to cheat on her husband and for someone who wasn't the king to sleep with the queen, a crime punishable by death. Lancelot escapes, but Guinevere doesn't, and this forces Arthur into an impossible situation, made all the worse by the fact that Mordred has been inciting Arthur's knights to remember how great they had it when they didn't care so much about being good. See, in order for Arthur's might for right justice system to work, he has to follow its rules just as much as everyone else, which hasn't been a problem until now. If he allows his system to function as it's meant to, Guinevere will stand trial in a fair, impartial court. That court will inevitably find her guilty, and that's exactly what happens. There were multiple witnesses who caught her in the act. If she is guilty, she is subject to the legally mandated sentence, which in this case is to be burned at the stake. Lancelot, if he is caught, will most certainly meet the same fate. If there is any hope of Arthur's justice system working long-term, he has to follow the will of the court without intervening, which means the woman he loves and his best friend will both die horrible deaths, which he absolutely doesn't want. But if he doesn't let Guinevere stand trial, if he steps in and uses his power as king to pardon her or change the sentence or change the law, etc., he will have permanently undermined his own ideals. After all, 
what's the point of a fair and just legal system that all are equally subject to if the king just steps in and changes the rules whenever he wants? Camelot will be over. Arthur is slightly spared this catch-22, but he still can't save Camelot. At the 11th hour, Lancelot appears with an army and rescues Guinevere. Though Arthur is grateful that his wife and friends survived, he is now forced to go to war with Lancelot, a situation made all the worse by the fact that Mordred has raised his own army against Arthur, ending the peace that Camelot had established for so long and sending England back into tribal warfare. Arthur's justice system quickly becomes a thing of the past, with battles once again determining right from wrong. My favorite part of the Camelot musical is the very end of the show. Arthur is sad and anxious the morning before the battle is going to begin. It's terribly early in the morning, and he has spent the whole night pleading for Merlin's help, which never comes, and going back through the story to see if there was anything that could have been done to prevent Camelot's fall, which has comprised the entire musical that we've just seen. Suddenly, he sees a young stowaway, a child around the same age that he was when he pulled the sword from the stone, who has come to Camelot with aspirations of joining the Knights of the Round Table. Arthur realizes the most important thing now is that people remember what they tried to do in Camelot and what they did achieve for a time, that it must be something people still fight and strive for. He sings to the boy in a heartbreaking altered reprise of the title song we first heard at the top of the show in a much different setting. The lyrics now are, Each evening from December to December, before you drift to sleep upon your cot, think back on all the tales that you remember of Camelot. Ask every person if he's heard the story, and tell it strong and clear if he has not, that once there was a fleeting wisp of glory called Camelot, where once it never rained till after sundown. By 8 a.m. the morning fog had flown. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. The show ends with him telling the boy to run, run away as far from the fighting as he can, for he must survive to be the person that makes sure the story is never forgotten. Nowadays, Camelot is most often thought of as a love story. It is, but not one between star-crossed lovers Guinevere and Lancelot. It is a love story between humanity and its ideals, as metaphorically reflected by the relationship between Arthur and Guinevere. We can love something, or someone, with all our heart, with the deepest, truest, and best parts of ourselves. And yet, we are human. Our humanity makes us glorious creatures just below the angels and the constructors of our own downfall. It is one of the best analogies to the complexities of human nature I've ever seen. And it makes us both despair and joy in the human condition all at once. This is a story where magic and spirituality are intimately woven into the very framework and serve as metaphors for the complex narrative, themes, and driving ideals, which, ironically, is exactly what was removed from the story in the Aaron Sorkin rewritten revival currently playing at Lincoln Center. The Variety review led with, Aaron Sorkin's rethink of a beloved Broadway musical loses the magic in every sense of the word. Time out? Camelot returns in a disenchanted revival. New York Daily News, a chilly Lincoln Center Camelot shorn of love, sex, and belief. The New York Daily News continues, just days after the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963, his grieving widow, Jackie Kennedy, quoted her late husband's favorite Broadway musical in an interview in Life magazine. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. This was an act of brilliant mythologizing, and it stuck. JFK's short, tragically curtailed administration became cemented in the American mind with Arthurian legend, and thus with justice, kindness, chivalry, eloquence, and romance. Had Jackie Kennedy seen the revival now at Lincoln Center, she'd hardly have chosen such a connection. This 2023 Camelot has more the nihilistic ambiance of Game of Thrones than an East Wing filled with art. It's the chilliest Camelot you ever did see. Variety goes on to say, the declared aim of Sorkin, 
was to eliminate the fantastical elements in the 1960s musical. But in its place, he and the veteran director Bartlett Shear jettisoned much of the fun, too. What remains is a cooler Camelot with its own head-scratching dramaturgy. In making the three central characters all tied up in emotional knots, yet strangely aloof, the production's creative team also deprives the show of much of its heart, joy, and romance. Even the cherished title song is the subject of mocking. Guinevere suggests that perhaps the sword, Excalibur, was simply loosened after so many tries, deflating the tale and turning the legend into a lucky pole. Morgan Le Fay, a sorceress in previous versions, has been transferred here into Mordred's unstable mom and a Middle Ages scientist. I have not seen the Lincoln Center revival, so I can't personally comment, but in general, the reviews seem to be largely in agreement. Though I have to say, based on the pictures and footage I've seen, I am loving the costume design by Jennifer Moeller, who seems to have been inspired by John Waterhouse's paintings, quite literally recreating some of his artwork in the design of the characters. Waterhouse was an English painter primarily known for embracing the pre-Raphaelite style and focusing on depictions of women from both ancient Greek mythology and Arthurian legend. His paintings, like Arthurian legend, strike a beautiful balance between realism and dreamlike fantasy. There is an important discussion in the theater world right now about how much, if any, changes should be made when reviving classic works. Should we acknowledge them in a museum-like way as products of their times and learn to read them in their original context? Or should we be free to take an ax to anything that doesn't fit with modern sensibilities? On the smaller front, this may include slightly altering language that is incredibly offensive today, and will likely take an audience out of the show. But in the fast-growing larger front, some productions are getting major overhauls to make them, for better or worse, more woke, thereby actually altering pretty major aspects of the piece. With living writers, and dead ones with legally airtight estates, you can't change one word of their text without permission. But what are the rules when it comes to a piece where the creators are no longer living? Is the joy and brand name recognition of pulling out a well-loved show worth it when, if you're going to alter an established piece practically beyond recognition, it would honestly make more sense to just write a brand new show. It is an important discussion, one that I think needs serious critical thought, as it is trying to balance the positive aim of making well-loved and, at this point, sometimes over a hundred year old shows inviting to modern audiences, while running the risk of opening theater up to radical censorship. Schools and regional theaters across the country are more and more often having their production shut down for deciding to take it upon themselves to rewrite shows according to their whims and specifications. School districts are banning books at an alarming rate. I'm nervous thinking about what the trickle-down effect might be if commercial productions start doing the same thing. After all, who is the arbiter of how a show should be rewritten to be the most appropriate? Whose morals and ideals are we following? Let's also keep in mind that what's politically correct today might be offensive tomorrow. I think about the example of Sweet Transvestite from Rocky Horror. At the time the show was written, transvestite was an appropriate term that was typically embraced by the LGBTQ plus community. Now that term is not appropriate. We've changed and evolved, but many of those in the LGBTQ plus community still feel inspired and empowered by the song, even though our vocabulary has moved on. Should they not? A hundred years from now, do we want to be left with telephone-esque versions of shows that bear little resemblance to their original form, where it becomes more and more difficult to reconstruct their original intentions? How do we avoid that while still welcoming in contemporary audiences who, myself included, would certainly feel jarred if certain words were being casually thrown around on stage? But like with Camelot, I don't think we can even begin to have those kinds of conversations about a particular work until we really understand the history, context, and intentions of that work. So much has been lost along the way in terms of our understanding of Camelot and the fuller legend it jumps off from. We can debate the flaws of a piece. Should it be trimmed? Tightened up? certain characters and plot points cut, but can we even start to talk about that when a shocking majority of even those in the theater community don't know the center of the story in the first place, and certainly don't know its history? We must learn about our stories, both in order to tell them, and so that what is edifying about them 
is not lost. Does the musical of Camelot do the most ideal job of communicating the themes of the story of Camelot? Perhaps not, but it does communicate them to some degree, and that is getting lost in a lot of noise surrounding the telephoneness of how we've come to look at this piece. The story of Camelot is one of my favorites. The musical Camelot, not necessarily, but I often think of how successfully it sums up that beautiful, terribly human joy and sorrow. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. There you go. Get, get comfy, Pops. You doing good there? 